So yesterday when we met, even though it was lab, I said we had to do some lecture stuff with it, only because we had Monday off. And one of the things we discussed in yesterday's class was the OSI model. And I told you that the OSI model was more of like a visual illustration to divvy up network responsibilities. So I said as a network administrator, you might have these around your offices just to illustrate what's going on in the communication process. Remember, the communication process has three elements to it, sender, the medium, and the receiver. We tend to get away from using the word sender and receiver because in that communication or that conversation, the sender and the receiver could flip roles. At one time, you're making a request. The next time, the server is fulfilling that request. So who becomes the sender and receiver? It all depends on the direction of flow, whether you're downloading or uploading. And so using a model, whether it's the OSI model, the TCP model, or even this particular model, it helps us visually see what's going on in the communication process, whose responsibility is what, and we have a question, sorry. Are they both considered senders and receivers because they're both originators? And that's why we like to just call them end devices. And the better terminology, and I'll be using from here on out, is an end device. An end device is anything that puts a message on the medium or pulls it off. In other words, they're the originator or the creator of the message. Yeah? Whereas an intermediary device either retransmits slashes retimes, manages the data flow, and or determines the best path. So I'm going to start back with the OSI model. In layer seven, I'm just going to pick on some random students. Let's see, Brett, what was layer seven? It was the top layer in the OSI model. Application. Application. And what was the function of this layer? Yep. Just basically user interface. So we use a web browser. We could use an email client like Outlook just so that we have some user-friendly approach before they get onto our network. Ian, what was the next layer, layer six? And what was the role of this layer? Yeah, remember the first layer, layer seven, and I know this is always funny, and I'll be doing this throughout the whole semester. What is first? Don't always think first is always the number one, because we'll learn that we always start counting with zero, and that might be the first address. Uh, in this case, the first layer, the application layer, is layer seven, okay? First being up top. So don't get your numbers associated with first always being one, okay? It's just not the case. So the first layer, the application layer, allows us to act as the interface between the user and the network. This layer is more of like a translator. It's going to take whatever they supplied and convert it into a network-friendly format. That is just simply a binary format, zeros and ones. Sometimes those zeros and ones can be encoded, uh, sorry, encrypted for security reasons, and most of the time they're compressed to save on bandwidth and other resources. Uh, Michael, up front, what was the uh, fifth layer? The session, layer. session layer. And in a nutshell, what, do you, what was the session layer's responsibility? It just basically man, uh, sorry, uh, handles or maintains dialogues between the sender and the receiver, between the end devices. Uh, the idea is you always want to think about a server and how a server has to fulfill the needs of others. And sometimes they can get overwhelmed. And so to prevent them from being too overwhelmed, they'll look at their session log and dis uh, sorry, disconnect idled connections. All right. The other example looking at is when you guys sign into a secure website like Facebook, and every time you click on a link, you're not inundated with username and password. All right? So a session is just a dialogue, if you will. All right, now this is where I tend to just dot this. Because by now, we have generated some data, whatever it could be. 
This is that resource that we share, right? Because a network is two or more devices connected together to share resources governed by a set of rules. And so this OSI model allows us to look at those set of rules and how they govern the data. Now we're going to add to this model. Let's see, uh, Eric, number two. Transport layer, all right. And I told you, I don't want you guys thinking this as this because of the word transport that it's going to pick up something and physically move it somewhere else. Rather, it coordinates the transmission activities. Uh, you can think of it as handling packages numbers, like a tracking number that UPS provides you when you guys order something. Um, this particular layer is going to be creating what we call a PDU. A PDU is a protocol data unit. I guess one could argue that layer 7, 6, and 5's PDU would be simply data, right? But layer 4's PDU is going to be called a segment. Now, that's the generic one. This layer is associated with two common protocols. I'm just going to put them in parentheses. One's called TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. And the other one's called UDP, User Datagram Protocol. Question? Is that the only difference between them? Uh, let's save that for chapter four. All right. I just want to be focusing on the different models. Um, like I said, we're going to save that to chapter four, but what I want you to arrive from this is this is the protocols. These are the two common protocols that are associated with the transport layer. And they generally produce a segment. And what is a segment? Well, by definition, a segment is a part of something, right? In this case, a segment is just part of that data that was generated by layer 7, 6, and 5. So just a piece of it. Why are we taking the data and breaking it up into pieces? Yeah, you know, it's almost like, you know, like you're, you got this tiny straw and you're sipping up something, right? What's easier, you know, a thick milkshake or a bottle of water to draw up from the straw? You getting the idea? And so something that's less weight can, distri can be distributed or transported across the network a lot easier. What is the other, what is the other benefit of uh, breaking into segments, Michael? What's that? Uh, let's not say correction, but because what happens, we just drop it and then we'll retransmit. And so what makes that nice is that we can recover when an error occurs a little bit easier because all I have to do is send the missing piece and not the whole entire file. All right? The last one is sort of debated issue whether it's a benefit or a disadvantage. And that is when we segment our data, we can multiplex it. And we love multiplexing because that allows multiple users to access that shared medium. It allows us to feel like we're all getting shared attention. However, certain companies or network administrators can abuse this and generate what we call priority policies, quality of service. And so there's been an ongoing debate whether this is really useful or not. Depending on what type of services, as we move everything onto this one big giant network, this is called a converged network, we have to prioritize things like 911 calls. And you guys can think about it. Our highway is an example of a converged network. We use it for pleasure, for business, for emergencies, correct? We have ambulances that use the same roads that we use. You guys might go on vacation using it for pleasure. You might be going on it to go to work. Now, who takes priority? You going on vacation or your neighbor going to work when they're on the highway? Neither, right? The only people that tend to take priority on our highways are the emergency services, ambulance, fire departments, police, correct? You notice those vehicles are a little bit different. They all come with a siren. Why? To warn you, get out of their way, they need to come. They're going to take priority. They're going to take precedence over that road. Well, likewise, as we converge our data, our voice, our TV, 
our music, even our Facebook statuses, onto one big giant network, we have to assign priorities. So that when I pick up my phone, and it's a voice over IP phone, I get a dial tone and I can talk to somebody. And if that somebody's 911, they can hear my emergency. I'm sure if you guys have used the voice over IP, sometimes you can pick it up, it sounds like you're in a cave, or packets are dropped and you can't hear somebody. Correct? Well, why is that the case? Is because there's so much traffic, because we converged everything in one common platform. We like converging everything on one common platform because look at our cell phones. They do just about everything. Look at our computers. They do about just everything. It makes it convenient for us to access this. It makes it popular, just like our highways. Now, are there other forms, other networks? Absolutely. But that's the good or the beneficial side of multiplexing with quality of service. Here's the other side of the coin. Just research Netflix and Comcast or even Time Warner. These ISP companies have throttled down Netflix traffic. Why would they do a thing like that? Yeah, see they want to tell the US government that it's because we offer voice over IP and that we want to make sure you get the quality voice calls so when they call the police department it'll get through. But the truth of it is it's a conflict of interest. Comcast, Time Warner, and all those other providers offer you three services. And it's ironic, they're offering you three services through one connection. They're offering you internet, cable, or television, and phone. Truth should be told is that they should be a broadband company and that's it. We have this old hierarchy still being established, whether it's telephone companies or cable companies, and that's called regulated monopolies. And they've been a big disadvantage for us when it comes to broadbands. Because they do not have to compete and because they don't have to compete, they do not have to offer you a quality of service. And that is a better connection. They should offer us a way to get to the world and let us pick our package. And what I mean by package are different speeds. And from there, we can choose any TV provider, any phone provider. In fact, this whole notion of cable TV and broadcasting the way it does should be thrown out. We shouldn't have to watch ABC the way we watch it at 8 o'clock at night because our favorite TV show's on. We should be able to go onto our TV and see that Breaking Bad's on and you can watch it anytime you want at your own convenience. Definitely. And that's the new way of looking at entertainment. But does Comcast want to get rid of that? Why not? Because it's about the money. They'll say you can buy a network connection or broadband connection for X number of dollars, but why not add TV? Why not add telephone? Now, you get your TV service through them, you get the telephone service through them. You're not happy with the quality. Why aren't you happy with the quality? Because that converged network is being occupied by your neighbor and everybody else streaming Netflix or whoever they choose to be going with as their content provider. So Comcast is irritated because they look bad People are spending hundreds of dollars a month for this service, so they say, instead of giving you a better connection, improving the wires to your house, we'll take the easier approach. And that's throttling down the Netflix service so that when you watch it, it looks shitty. And if you go to Comcast, it looks great. That's almost like paying off the police department to pulling over every target truck that goes on 17 so Walmart is always getting the fresh produce and Target is without. Would you shop at Target if your milk is stale? If your lettuce is rotten? If they still have the iPad 1 because they can't get the new iPad 3 in there because every time they try to deliver it they're getting pulled over by the police? Is it fair? And so that's the controversy that lies with this concept of segmentation, multiplexing with QoS. That all occurs at this level right here. And this is why this model helps us, because we can see at different parts what devices can be implemented to ensure quality of service. But that can be abused. So there are advantages and disadvantages of this. Let's go on to layer three. Layer three, oh, the other Eric, right up front. 
Network layer. Okay, what's the PDU for the network layer? Called. Eric, I'm still with you, sorry. What's that? Uh, that's the protocol. So he's giving me the protocol, but, and this is where Cisco named its application after. Packet. It's one of the most common phrases that's thrown out there. Sometimes it gets abused. But Eric mentioned a protocol that actually generates a packet, and that is the Internet protocol. Now remember, these protocols are going to tell you the format, the structure of each part of the layer, if you will, and how these layers are going to be interconnected. Because remember, OSI stands for the Open System of Interconnected. So as these protocols are formatting the data, adding header to it, or maybe even a trailer, and passing it down, there's got to be some kind of system in play that gets these to work together. In fact, one classic model is called the TCP slash IP model because it's generated from these two popular protocols. And as network administrators, like I said yesterday in class, these two layers are what we're going to be focusing most of our time on. One's about organizing the, uh, the delivery, and the other one's actually delivering it. This is used for end-to-end -end delivery. So what about layer two? Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Ryan. And what's going on in the data link? It's going to connect that logical world, all this stuff up here, with the physical world. And so it's going to be using some media access control protocols. One example might be Ethernet. And what that standard, or protocol if you will, will produce is called a frame. What makes this layer unique from the other layers is that not only will it add a header to the packet, but it'll also add a trailer. And what was the significant part of the trailer, Marcus? What was the role of the trailer in the data link layer? Remember, this is where the tires meet the pavement, if you will. We're just about to send the vehicle out there. It's going to be going on this wire. And this particular medium is made of copper. And I said copper is very prone to EMFs and RFs. And so they could generate electrical signals on here that a network interface card could mistaken as a 0 and a 1, or 0 or a 1. And so this layer has to add a trailer to sort of validate, if you will, or detect any errors that occurred. All right, so the significant part of the trailer, and that's why it's at the very end of it, is to validate that everything was received correctly. If it wasn't, it'll just drop it and life goes on. Okay, folks? The only layer that actually adds a trailer. The last layer, Ashley, which was? And what exactly happens in this layer? Yeah, this is going to be where they start sending out the signals. Uh, this switch would be an example of a physical component, right? And in that switch is going to be a port. We commonly call them either interface cards or just ports. And those ports are going to be, in that particular case, generating electrical impulses. Impulses or pulses? Electrical pulses. And impulses when you do something sporadic. So electrical pulses, that will be representing either a 0 or a 1. And that is the idea of the coding process. Remember, folks, we'll be beating this OSI model to death as the semester goes on. It's a nice roadmap to where we're at. Every chapter from here on out will be covering one particular layer. That would be chapter three, application. We'll be skipping over six and five. Chapter four, transport. Chapter five, network. Chapter six will be still honing on the network. Then we'll come back to data link. And then finally, the physical layer. All right? There is another model that I was discussing that you guys still need to, that you need to know. It's like why have two models when one does it just as well? This 
model is more of like the very detailed breaking things down to assign everybody some responsibility. The new model I'm about to show you makes life real easy for us all. In fact, in my other intro to computer courses, when I get to the networking part of that course, I will only be focusing on the TCP slash IP model. Why? One, it's only got four layers. Two, each layer sort of makes sense to what they do. The application layer is the first three layers of the OSI model. And that all makes sense to me. Because I look at today's modern web browsers and how they basically do all this stuff. Not only do they act as a user interface, but web browsers are actually displaying content. And it's amazing the kind of content they're displaying. In fact, the new office is going to be accessed from a web browser. How do we access Microsoft Office right now? It has to be installed. That's just remarkable. The fact that it's going to be stored on the cloud and I can access from any platform, that means my cell phone, my tablet, my Mac, my Windows, I don't have to install it. I can buy a subscription, whether it's monthly, yearly, or just for that particular moment. And when they make a new update, it's already there. And if my computer goes down, no problem. Jump on a friend's computer. Oh, they don't have Microsoft Office? No problem, as long as they have a network connection. And that's why I'm saying this field, all these new emerging technologies depend on us. Without that infrastructure, what good would it be to have a Ford, a Chevy, a Chrysler, when we're still on dirt roads? You might as well buy a horse. And the price of gas, a horse will probably be cheaper. Right? So we need the infrastructure. So we have the application layer. Next layer. called the transport layer. Hey, look at that. What do you think that maps to? And we have another layer called the internet or the internetwork layer. And I told you there's four, so the last one's going to cover the last two of the OSI model. And that simply is going to be what we call the network access layer. Like I said, they seem appropriately named network access layer. This is where they're going to go out on the physical network and transmit or receive the data. Does that mean this layer, since it only, sorry, this model only has four layers, that it doesn't do exactly what goes on over here? Yeah. It does exactly everything that's done over here. It just means that these people are consolidating, giving more responsibilities to programmers, more responsibilities to engineers, and leaving the same responsibilities to network administrators as the OSI model did. Now, to me, if I'm Linksys or D-Link or Netgear, and I'm creating physical devices, like network interface cards, switches, routers, modems, hubs, the list goes on and on and on. Who do you think I'm going to hire? Electrical engineers, right? So I told you electrical engineers are going to be down here. Manufacturers are going to be up here. Do you see how this model really clears that all up? They realize that these two layers are very critical. And you know what? If I'm also a manufacturer, I'm going to hire developers. Now, for the longest time, Lynx has had a big problem with this, and it was very disappointing. They would create network interface cards, but their drivers were horrible. You know who also had that same problem? ATI. They would make some wonderful graphics cards, but their drivers were shitty. Folks, there are two sides to a coin here. You can have a wonderful graphics card, but if your driver isn't using that graphic card to its full potential, isn't buggy, then what's the point of spending thousands of dollars for these high-end graphics cards when the software is shit? 
likewise. At this layer, we're going to be writing drivers to install on the operating system that's going to utilize the actual physical component. So there's two places that are being employed here. Software people up here, engineers down there. Where's the other spot the software people are going to be utilized? There. Now you can't have one without the other. I always illustrate this point with my students. Is there a difference between the internet and the World Wide Web? A lot of people interchange the two. And that's like fingernails on chalkboard. They are not the same. Granted, one wouldn't exist without the other, and the other wouldn't make the one popular. Translation. The internet's been around since 1969, 1968. It was developed part of the defense, sorry, the Department, of, the Department of Defense and part of the Advanced Research Project, ARPANET. And the idea was to get universities, government, and high other end facilities to share resources across a global network. Translation, folks, let's talk about World War II. What happened to end World War II? And what sparked the technology error? We dropped the bomb, and it scared the shit out of people. And then Russia, or Soviets at the time, and the Americans, us, were having this big escalation. And we're funding money left and right into scientists, because we realized for the first time ever that technology was going to advance us. And it was out of fear. What are they doing? we got to be better. So we had this great space race. But through all this time, we had this Red Scare, this Cold War. And so what were we concerned about? The Soviets taking a submarine and docking it right next to Manhattan Island. From that position, they can wipe out the whole East Coast. More importantly, what's on the East Coast that always baffled me in this country? This is what happens when you stick too much to your traditions. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. should be right there in the middle of the country. Not from the ocean. Well, now with, you know, continental missiles, I guess it wouldn't make a difference. But maybe we can set up our missile defense system around our own coastal lines and not around other countries. Regardless, we were concerned. Because if they were to initiate the first strike, how are we going to give the go-ahead codes to launch our missile silos? Which, by the way, where were our missile silos being built? Other side of the country. And folks, we don't have the infrastructure that we have today. Making a long-distance phone call was unheard of. You had to use telegrams. So they developed this system to connect these. And when you see this diagram, this video, it's posted, you'll see that the East and West Coast are building up their networks. And there's only like one or two lines going across the whole country. And it's disgusting. And those one or two lines still exist today. AT&T, MCI, and Sprint. Now, of course, their names might have changed, but they have made their backbone that we use today for the internet. And now we have satellites and microwave transmissions and stuff like that to add to the robustness of it. But at that point, it was all about having a counter strike. So if one point would fail, we can still get the message out there. And that was what the internet was developed on, that platform, hence the Department of Defense. But it has since exploded. Because scientists were sharing all their resources on how to make better weapons. I mean, we added the UK. And we added all these other countries that are part of the ally forces to this network. And we realized, wow, look how powerful this was. We can instantly share something, add to it, and learn exponentially. And look what happened to technology. We went from vacuum tubes to transistors. And when we hit the transistors, everything was changing exponentially because the material was readily available. Cold War comes to an end. The wall comes down. And we have this infrastructure in place. And the government's like, it's their tax dollars. What should we do with it? And that's when they released it to us. And at that time, Tim Berners-Lee was like, hey, there's all this information out there, but it's not user friendly. And he developed the World Wide Web developed this concept of a web browser and this notion of a hyperlink. 
and this simple structured language called HTML that you can take all these existing text files, add a few tags to it, make them into a web page, and link to each other. And that's when you and I were able to get onto the internet. ISPs became available in the early 90s. Either it was CompuServe, Prodigy, or AOL. And from there, things started growing. Because the World Wide Web was giving us an opportunity to add content to this new space. One cannot exist without the other. But if it wasn't for the World Wide Web, you and I would have no need to be on the internet. It wasn't very friendly. It's like using DOS today. Look how far our operating systems have advanced. What is the world going to hold for a web and the internet tomorrow? Can't tell you. These two models here have been around since the 70s. They haven't changed. This gives us flexibility. It allows somebody down here to make faster, better interface cards without, afflect, without affecting somebody up here. So we get that flexibility. This concept of breaking things down into tinier pieces and modifying, and, well, I shouldn't say modifying, but adding to that whole encapsulation part has allowed our networks to grow, adapt, and still keep to their original roots. We do not tell you you must have a Windows PC to access the internet. Hell, we don't even tell you it must be Ethernet. You guys can access the internet through your cell phones, and you're not using an Ethernet. You can access it through microwaves, even through satellites. Hell, if you're desperate, you can probably even access it through an FM channel. about the flexibility. It's about the openness. Now, are all protocols like TCP, IP open? No. In fact, Microsoft has tried their attempt to make their own layer 3 protocol. We called it Net. Oh, is it called Bayou? Let's see. Net. Uh, gosh, it escapes me. It's called Bayou, but I'm trying to remember how it's yeah, I think it's like that, but I think the S is in there. And uh, another one, another company that tried to make one was Apple. Yeah, surprise, surprise. We call that Apple Talk. And another company that tried to make one was called Novell. And they used IPX. And Novell at the time was more into phones than they were into computers. And they're saying, hey, no thing. Computer is a computer. Phone is a phone. In fact, Novell was on top of something. This whole convergence. Look at our phones now. In fact, people buy smartphones and they don't even use it for a phone as much as they use it for other things. And so it's just going to be called IPX extensions. Phone systems have PBXs. Phone extensions. You know, when you dial a number, you just dial the extension afterwards. That's what they were thinking. A group of phones tied together is called a branch. Today we call them networks. And in those networks or in those branches, there's individual devices that have their own separate address. No two devices on the same network can have the same address. What is this layer all about? Addressing each device so we can perform end-to-end -end delivery. Why did these protocols disappear? Microsoft only worked with Windows. It was called Windows Workgroups. Apple Talk only worked with? Apple. IPX only worked with? Actually, any, uh, any, soft, any device that had Novell software installed in it. It was about the only one that was sort of like cross-platform, you know, independent. However, they didn't write too much software, and they only wrote it for Windows. Okay? And you had to pay a lot of money per each client. All this translated into dollars. So IP, IP's been around, very open. Said, use us. We don't care because we value the importance of having all these devices on our network. If we didn't value this importance, if the internet wasn't so popular, why would you guys get on it? Why would you pay X number of dollars a month to be a part of that? 
So this open platform allowed companies like HP to make network printers and install an Ethernet card in there that would work with any Ethernet network as long as they followed the standards. And so we said, look, TCP, beautiful relationship. If you guys all agree to that, we can start writing software. In fact, when you go to change your network interface card in your Windows, you will see the TCP slash IP protocol on there. If you have a Mac and you go to change your interface to settings, you will see the TCP slash IP protocols. In fact, if you go over there and hit the menu button, you'll go down to the network selection on that printer, and surprise, surprise, you will see the TCP slash IP configuration. Their popularity has made the internet very user friendly as far as what device do I buy. If it says Ethernet, it's going to work on your private network as long as you have every device on there Ethernet. This is why you guys tend to call these cables Ethernet cables. Do not fall into that. Do not mix Kleenex with tissues. Kleenex produces tissues. A tissue is not a Kleenex because there's other companies that make tissues. Right, folks? So how does this affect us? And where do we go from here? We're going to take this model, whether it's the OSI or the TCP slash IP model, and we're going to see it in action. I'm one of those instructors that hate using PowerPoints. However, this week you guys will see I will have a voiceover PowerPoint to walk you through Chapter 2 because we missed Monday's class, right? You want to make sure you watch that PowerPoint. It will be posted later today before you take Chapter 2's assessment this week. So I have PC1. I'm going to connect it to a switch. I have PC2. I'm going to connect that to a switch. At this point, I have a local area network. What are the properties of a local area network? One, they're administrated by a single person or organization. They have a small geographical space, or the same geographical space. Two, basically the number of users. The other thing that helps characterize a local area network is the type of data that travels on a local area network. In here, I will share you some of my files that I wouldn't share out in the public because you guys paid for that resource. Corporation Corning, I will share grades with the administrators, but I wouldn't share that across a public network. I also added a router. I'm just going to put a little G underneath that router because you guys are used to calling that like a gateway. It's no different than a door in a classroom. So if I were to put a box around here, If this was just the internet, it would be a pretty boring place. Why? Because the kinds of resources you share here aren't all that thrilling, unless you guys write TV shows, unless you guys produce TV shows. To me, most of the stuff that you guys probably share in your house is probably going to be your internet connection, a printer, and that's about it. Now, if you went and download, bought your DVDs and then you ripped them and put them on your hard drive, maybe you'll share those movies. But what did you have to do? You had to go outside your network, buy that, and bring it in. So this gateway allows us just that. Allows us to connect to another network. Hence the word interconnected networks. Internet. Bunch of networks connected together. Bunch of LANs, if you will. And likewise, whoops. Now, technically I could call this PC1. But for illustration purposes, so it makes it easier for me to tell you what's happening, I'm just going to call it PC3 and PC4. Why can I do that? Because they exist in two different worlds, right? Two different networks. And they're separated by what we call a WAN, a wide area network. So this is LAN 2, this is LAN 1, and in between them, is a wide area network. Let's use the classroom as an example. This is a single network. The classroom behind us is another network. How are they connected together? The hallway. So the hallway would be an example of a wide area network. If this is the sender, 
Oh, let me spell that out here. And this is the receiver. What's going to happen over here on the PC is I'm going to be using an application. Let's say I'm going to be using Instant Messenger. Okay? So I'm just sending out a text message. So I'm on the application layer. Now I'm going to be coming down through the application layer to the what layer? Presentation layer. Because I'm sending a text message, I'm going to use ASCII to convert the letters into binary. We good about that? And now the session layer. And think about how instant messaging works. You have a little friends list over here. They have a friends list over there. And you can see from time to time friends come and go, right? That's what the session layer is doing. They're making sure the person you're about to send this to appears. And if they're not there, they might send it and store it as a little answer machine. Back in the day, it used to be and only in real time. Okay? So the session layer is just making sure that the person's there and is ready to receive it. So now the transmit layer is going to be using TCP. This protocol is going to stamp two addresses on there. One's called the destination port address, and the other one's called a source address, source port address. Now, I don't remember what instant messaging's port address is. You guys can Google it, and you'll just see what it is, because every different application will have a different port address associated to it. The idea is, though, this port address let's just say it's 5,000, represents a particular service that you are using. So that when it comes over to this person, and on this person's computer, it'll go to the right software. Because they could have a lot of different softwares running at the same time accessing the network, right? Instant messaging, well, sorry, uh, Internet Explorer, hell, even uTorrent if you're using that, all of which are software running on the same computer accessing the same network connection. So we need to identify what software is making the request or what software is going to be receiving it. And that's what these port addresses do. On the source side, it might be some randomly generated number. Let me just say, oh, 80 is not a good one. I think we used 49,000 yesterday. I'll continue using that. So this is me adding to the data. I'm going down the OS model. I'm encapsulating it, adding to it. So this is the TCP header. Now I'm going to get to an IP protocol on the network layer. And what, I, what am I going to add here? A source address and a destination address. Do I know what my, door, my source and destination address is? No. I haven't given that to you. So if I say this network is 192.168.1. This one's .1, .2, .3. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. And then I come over here and I say this network address is 192.168.2. And this one will be 1.2. Do you see how they have different network addresses as well as they should because they belong on two different networks? Later I'll explain that you could actually use the same one because these are private addresses. But that's for a later class. So dot one is going to be sending it to, oh, guess what? Dot one. Obviously, I need to put the whole 32-bit in there and say 192.168.2.1. Oops, this is network one. 168.2.1. We good about that? Next layer, we're going to be using Ethernet. Ethernet's going to require that every one of my interface cards have a ma machine code. A MAC address. I'm going to say this is AA, this is AB. It's a lot longer, but fortunately, we'll save that for another class. Let's make this one BA, BB, and make this one BC. MAC addresses are used for local delivery. There's going to be a source, the source is going to be AA, but the destination is not going to be what you guys think. The destination will not be BA. Rather, the destination is going to go to this router, and it's going to be AC. Why is it going to that? You guys are getting ready to pack up your stuff, and you guys are going to leave. The way you get out of this classroom is through that door, right? So that door is C002. And you're going to go on to the hallway, and then you guys are going to find another door. 
whether it's C004 for your next classroom. Do you see how you went from door to door and each of those doors were different ports? You do local delivery to met, pass the message from place to place to place. In this case, this is the encapsulation process, taking it from the sender to the receiver, going down the stack. Once I get to the physical layer, I'm doing all those zeros and ones. Then I come back up the stack, and PC3 finally gets the message. Like I said, folks, there will be a PowerPoint posted uh, tonight. Watch the video. Assessment this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, check Cisco's website. You guys take care.